Hello everyone and welcome to a very long awaited episode of Red Raptor Rights. This has been a massive series, spanning over 20 years of dinosaur documentaries. Now we finally reached last year's prehistoric planet. This won't be the end though, as I'll go back and cover some of the ones I missed. In case you've been living under a rock for a year, Prehistoric Planet is a 5 part docuseries that released on Apple TV+. It stars the absolute legend David Attenborough as its host and narrator, and covers life in different ecosystems at the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. With a whole decade of new paleontological discoveries and improving special effects since the last wave of great documentaries, how good is Prehistoric Planet? Well, accuracy-wise. Is it truly the best dino documentary ever like many have claimed, or does it fall flat? Let's dig this up. As I write this review, I'm trying my best to avoid the hype train. The anticipation surrounding this documentary was greater than any from my memory, you know, cause I was only a few months old when Walking with Dinosaurs dropped. Whether or not the dark side clouds my vision, there's still an astronomical amount of praises to give. The creators paid attention to all the updated views on paleobiology, morphology, ontogeny, and ecology that have been sorely lacking from much of the content we've seen prior. Of course, some discoveries weren't made yet, hence why I had an outdated section. But still, it's nice to see Apple TV follow modern paleontological views rather than the general public's perception of paleontology. I see the problem. Oh, do ya! The near flawless CGI, Hans Zimmer's excellent scoring, and wonderful narration by Attenborough are sweet icing on an already flavorful, moist red velvet cake. If you've watched my channel before, you know I'm a big fan of Rick Raptor. As one of his fans, I of course watched his review months ago, and I think that's a great place to start. A lot of his praise for the series boils down to it showing these Mesozoic creatures as actual animals. Doing the things that animals do. They each act like animals and do completely natural things that typically aren't shown in paleomedia, so it subverts expectations in a totally natural and realistic way. Tyrannosaurus swimming. How many times have you seen this before, despite it being probable? Even massive land animals like elephants are able to swim. Why not T-Rex? The dreaded Mosasaurus just chills on a reef to get its teeth cleaned. We see this happen to modern apex predators too. Sharks and memoras, crocs and plovers. It could have happened in the Cretaceous. Barbarodactylus femboys infiltrating the females. I'm gonna pretend I didn't already come up with that plan in high school. Never tried it though, but seemingly successful. Triceratops taking after parrots by eating clay to help them feast on more toxic plants. An entire segment is devoted to Dinochirus pooping, then scratching itself. There's a Choodontid that spreads forest fires to expose small critters, like some modern birds of prey, though this may be a stretch. Choodontids may have had the greatest ratio of brain to body size, but estimating dinosaur intelligence can have laughable results, like that new one that gave Tyrannosaurus primate level intellect. Just because modern birds do this 66 million years later, doesn't mean non-avian dinosaurs did it too. To make matters worse, the bird lineage split off from the rest of them by the Middle Jurassic, a hundred million years prior. Dreadnoughtus having these big inflatable neck balloons and going full elephant seal mode smacking each other around, also seem like stretches. They had air sacs throughout their skeleton, sure, but balloons? Some of you are okay with this, some of you think it's too much. I'm kind of in the middle here. Okay, okay, I'm not in the negatives. These two just seem like too much of a leap for some. Generally speaking, I love the animalistic behaviors. They strike the perfect balance between being bloodthirsty monsters and being so tame that they're anthropomorphic. There are so many more fascinating behaviors to see than hunting for the thousandth time. Yes, there is still some of that, especially with babies. This is basically baby murder to show. I'd much rather watch a few baby Therizinosaurus try to snag some honey, something new. Even the mighty Tyrannosaurus is never shown hunting anything. We see one immediately after the hunt, though not the battle itself. 
Its cousin Tarbosaurus has the chillest vibes ever. The only time it springs into action is to chase away an annoying Velociraptor who woke it up from its nap. Very relatable. But yeah, going to the other end of the spectrum, nobody wants anthropomorphized subjects. We saw that in Dinosaur Revolution. Yes, writers should tell entertaining stories, but turning the creatures into humanoid characters is not the way to get there. So anyways, Rick Raptor, you're a chad and you make great points. Going off of that, most of the speculation works because it's grounded and believable. There's good speculation with behaviors found in analogous animals with similar niches and some plausible extrapolations from fossil evidence. And then there's bad speculation, which often entails awesome bro or even totally random behaviors pulled from thin air. Just watch Jurassic Fight Club for these. You got bloodthirsty predators, hand signaling Dromaeosaurus, the toxic Rex bite, and even Deinonychus that use thunder to mask their footsteps. Praise the lord, prehistoric planet never goes as far. Again, some stuff is a little suspect, but nothing atrocious. I don't know, it looks kind of suspect. Could be an imposter, you know, um... We'll cross that bridge of negativity when we get there. The speculation is usually creative, yet plausible. Another great example would be with Carnotaurus. Their arms were puny with very little in the way of function, but still had a wide range of motion with their shoulders along with large muscle attachments. Twirling like they're at the club seems like a logical conclusion. Next, let's move on to these designs because holy swamping Shrek, prehistoric planet has many bests. Creatures portrayed better here than in any other media. I promise not to make this yet another Tyrannosaurus episode, but give credit where credit is due. This is the best I've seen the king on screen. It has all the features I've been begging for for two years now, and none of the drawbacks that have sunk other versions. The hands stay in the correct position, so the wrists never break. Adults are covered in leathery skin, but with a tiny bit of speculative fuzz, not overdoing it. Yeah, this has been a matter of debate, but lips seem likely, so no sharp teeth are sticking out to make them look scarier. The face has keratinous bumps above each eye and down the snout. No dramatic roaring is present, instead we hear deep bellows. And of course, we need that chonky thickness. This is the perfect T-Rex. Well, for now. Who knows what studies the future brings? Well, I mean actually reliable studies. Another group we've spent too much time on is the Mosasaurids. I mean, come on, lizards that became giant marine predators? Tell me this isn't cool. Another best for sure here, Mosasaurus and the recently described Kaikaifalu from Antarctica are both great exceptions, though I have some nitpicks for Kaikaifalu later. I literally could not have asked for a better Mosasaurus Hoffman eye. It has everything I could have asked for. Its body is round and streamlined. There's the counter shading that's present in many marine predators. That tail fluke I've gone on and on about. We briefly see the pterygoid teeth on the roof of the mouth. There's even a forked tongue since this was an actual lizard unlike every dinosaur whose name ends in Saurus. This is peak performance. I also love the Ornithomimus, probably the best of the genus and its family we've seen so far. Plus their segment is a lot of fun as they're each trying to build nests with vegetation but start stealing from each other. On one hand you have the man Ornithomimus who build for themselves but also parasites who steal from them. A man builds, a parasite asks, where is my share? It's another case of yeah, we don't have direct fossil evidence for any of this, but it's an interesting behavior that's still in the realm of possibility. Each of the Hadrosaurids too, look amazing, and again, probably the best that we've seen. Finally, I don't have to bring up in the outdated section how they had a large nail on each of their front limbs, or the fact that they're not actually duck build, instead having a keratinous beak to snip branches. The Arctic Troodontid too is finally called an arctic troodontid, and not troodon. Finally, creators stopped banking on the popularity of the troodon name to deliver something actually scientific. What we get here looks phenomenal on top of not being lumped into the dreaded wastebasket name again. All the dromaeosaurids present are just dang. Dang. Damn, damn, damn.
Alright, there are a lot of bests, but I have to keep going. Let's mention the Tarangosaurus and other unspecified Elasmosaurids. I've covered them in past reviews, but now so many good ideas have been put on screen at once, giving us an all-around best again. They eat rocks to help with ballast and digestion, they give birth to live young, and their tail rudders are on full display for everyone to love. Finally, they're not cannon fodder either. Often we've seen them getting clapped by some Mosasaurid, but in this documentary they actually fight back. Everywhere you look, modern paleontological theories are being brought to the forefront, reshaping the way people view prehistoric creatures. The paleo community desperately needed this since portrayals have been stuck in inaccurate 90s mode for decades. That's not to slam Jurassic Park as a movie, it's a fantastic movie, but it's Hollywood entertainment. Yet somehow it's clasped the nards of paleo art and even educational content for decades. Hence why we have Jurassic Fight Club and Tarbosaurus the Mightiest Ever. A heavy focus is placed on pterosaurs. Okay, I know I've been asking for a pterosaur episode, but this is a little much. I would have loved to see some of their screen time go to other animals like some crocodiliforms or ichthyornithines instead, but I should review the show I got, not the one I wanted. When on screen though, they're absolutely gorgeous. But to be fair, the animators had lots of creative liberty, since many of the flyers shown are very fragmentary. There's enough to piece together where they fit in the pterosaur family tree, their size, and maybe general appearance, but not too much more than that. Phosphato Draco, for instance, is known from only neck vertebrae. Comparing it to other relatives, experts can tell how this was a mid-sized Asdarkid with a wingspan of about 5 meters or 16 feet. The rest of its appearance is copied and pasted from other Asdarkids, which, you know, is the best anyone can do for the time being. Another member of the Moroccan, uh, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that, is Alcyone, a fragmentary pterosaur, but a nyctosaurid. Bits and pieces are known, including a humerus, femur, and lower mandible. Only juveniles are shown in the foreground, but if you squint closely enough, you can see adults with brightly colored beaks hidden from view. This genus is shown getting griefed by the larger baby-eating nyctosaurid, Barbarodactylus grandis. Neither one has a good enough skull to know what kind of ornamentation they had, if any. Prehistoric Planet went more conservative with Alcyone, but wild with Barbarodactylus, providing a fun variation of the skull we know from Nyctosaurus itself. I have to point out some amazing attention to detail with both. Members of the Nyctosauridae family actually lack fingers and hands with the exception of their wing finger. This is contrasted with the more terrestrial Ashdarkids that have fingers and hands which correctly have palms facing forwards while flying, but with their hands pointing backwards when walking on land. Not only does this work with their morphology, but even tracks from this family preserve their way of quadrupedal locomotion. The two largest pterosaurs ever, Hatsagopteryx and Quetzalcoatlus, also make big appearances. And guess what both of these guys do? Murder, Goofy! I love murder! Bro, why is every animal a child predator in this show? Um, I think you mean minor attracted reptile. Despite being giant as Darkids from the late Maastrichtian, key differences are shown here. The Quetzal is a leaner animal with a taller neck and longer, thinner beak. Hatsagopteryx, on the other hand, is a thick boy with a stronger, wider beak and shorter neck. This is probably due to differing niches. Hatsagopteryx was the top predator in Europe, so it needed to tackle larger, yet still dwarfed, prey. Quetzalcoatlus had to share its ecosystem with Tyrannosaurus, so it would have been confined to the niche of hunting smaller prey. The one exception I'll make for these positives is the portrayal of Teti Draco. Yeah, maybe five years ago when it was described as a Tyrannodontid, this would have been perfect. Too bad that in 2020, a wing was assigned to the genus, then determined to be an Asdarkid instead. So Teti Draco would have been more like Phosphata Draco. It's even been suggested that the two may even be synonymous. Well, there goes the best pteranodontid ever put on screen. I do enjoy seeing the amount of pterosaur diversity though. There is still the idea floating around that dinosaurs and pterosaurs were already dying out, or at least shrinking in biodiversity before the meteor struck. 
The vast amounts of pterosaur material from Morocco seem to refute this idea. I will admit, there's lots of back and forth on this. It's definitely a subject for another day. Two more details I'll mention for all pterosaurs shown is that first, each of their wings accurately fold backwards when grounded, rather than breaking themselves to fold inwards like in lots of pop culture. Second, it's nice to see each and every inclusion covered in downy coats of pycno fibers, hair-like filaments that provided insulation. Feathers and pycno fibers are always appropriately used, which is far from the norms as we've seen before. Dinos aren't overfeathered like in Evolutionary Journey and Dino World, but no one is underfeathered either. I will admit though, there is a debate to be had for the large body Therizinosaurus and Dinochirus, whether they were so big that they wouldn't need fluff or were only sparsely feathered. That's it for the pterosaurs. They take a long duration of this review because they take a long duration of the show. Moving on from the designs, finally. Okay, we're still kind of talking about designs, but now in regards to ontogeny, how animals grow up. This dino doc kills it here. Look at Triceratops for instance, we get a perfect showcase of how they change over time, since we follow this horrifying yet cute juvenile on his journey. This horrific look is spot on. Babies possess a short face, lower, backwards facing frill, and small horns that pointed backwards. A variety of ages are shown here. Some adults are given horns that don't face completely forwards yet, and epicipitals on the frill that are still sharp and more pronounced. The most mature individuals have epicipitals all but totally reabsorbed, and longer faces and horns fully forwards. Next there's Tyrannosaurus and its young, one of the most famous scenes in the whole show. T-Rexes this young have yet to be found, yet from other juveniles we know about in this genre and from relatives, this makes perfect sense with its lanky limbs and thinner snout. The downy coat is still speculative, though possible. It would have kept the young warm since obviously they didn't have the bulk of their parents. Young Tyrannosaurids also show ancestral conditions such as the aforementioned body proportions. Their Tyrannosauroid ancestors like Dilong show direct fossil evidence of similar feathers. More children to mention are the Admontosaurus and Allura Titan, both following similar growth. Juvenile Hadrosaurids, including Admontosaurus and Nectins, had much shorter faces that stretched out as they aged. This applies to the Lambiosaurines, like the young Allura Titans in the show, but they also have a small bump where the crest should be, which is consistent with what we know about growth in the ornamental Lambiosaurines. None of them started out with these big, massive, flashy crests, instead growing them over the course of their lives. And hey, while on the subject of growing up, I love the details given to pterosaurs here. Prehistoric Planet clearly emphasizes the presence of soft-shelled pterosaur eggs, which, wouldn't you know it, have been found. In the Chinese, yeah, try to pronounce that, 215 eggs were found. Some of them even contained embryos inside. Each of these eggs more closely resembled soft snake eggs rather than the hard shells we associate with the living archosaurs. The flyer at this site has been named Homipterus, a relative of Ornithochirus. But even other groups of pterosaurs, Tapayarids, left evidence of colonies. You'd think these guys were British. In Brazil, 47 individuals were found together, belonging to various ages. This came from a late Cretaceous Tapayarid. Once again, not gonna try it. So the scenes with big flocks coming together are accurate. Because pterosaurs are so diverse though, not everyone is presented doing this. Quetzalcoatlus, a large terrestrial predator, is depicted building an individual nest, which sounds reasonable. A colony of giant as darkids would be terrifying. So there's so much to praise in Prehistoric Planet, and it's unfortunate that I can't get to everything and everyone. If I were to do that, it could take a year of my time and I'm not about that. This video is already like 20 minutes or something crazy like that, so I'm going to save the negatives for a part two. There is a substantial amount to talk about, mostly nitpicks and mostly addressing the community around this show, and that would also take a substantial amount of time. So guys, remember if you enjoyed this video to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. Part two, coming soon.